From Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, and the home of Hot Chicken, it's the Rick Altizer Show. Sit back, buckle up. Rick will talk with the movers, shakers, and creators who put Christ in Christian entertainment. He's a man who's clear so the world can hear. Here's Rick Altizer. Hey, thank you for joining me today. That was Bob Allen, the voice of the Rick Altizer Show. And today I have... Southern gospel extraordinaire singer Joseph Habedank. How'd I say on that, Joseph? Man, I am so impressed with your pronunciation of my last name. Most people, Rick, put an R. Haber? Haberdank. Haberdank, Haberdank. Or, uh, Habedank, Hobdank. I mean, I've heard it all. Habedank. Or, Hoobastank. Hoobastank. Which was actually my... Nickname in high school because there was a rock band that had a one-hit wonder called The Reason, and they were called Hoobastank. So that got that name. Yeah, I got that name in high school. Habedank. Joseph Habedank. You are a Southern Gospel singer extraordinaire, with uh, formerly with the band The Perrys. Not the band Perry, the, mind you. Not the band Perry, the uh, Southern Gospel group The Perrys. Correct. Got it. The Singing Perrys. The Singing. That's, <laughs> back in the uh, 80s and 90s, the Singing Perry family. Make them welcome. Yeah. It was like singing. everybody. The Singing Gaithers. The Singing, you know, you name it. And what? You've been nominated? You, Grammy? What's what's that all? What? Yeah. What, what do you tell me all about that? Yeah. Well, I tell you what. We were at, uh, believe it or not, my, so my wife's grandmother had just passed away. And I, she, one of her favorite places on earth is Disney World. So I took her to Disney the week after the funeral. And um, and to be honest with you, I think this was God rewarding me because I am not a huge Disney fan. I like Disney. I just don't like all the walking. I'd rather be at the, the best part about Disney is the hotel room to me. To me, I like I'd rather just sit, sit down, you know, watch my watch my TV or my computer or whatever, you know. So I'm, I, I go to bed that night and uh, I knew the Grammys were coming out the next day, but I didn't think I'd never been nominated before. So I didn't think a thing of it. And uh, I woke up. And my wife shook me. It was early in the morning. She said, we got it. I think she said, you got it. I said, got what? Like, I'm half asleep. You got the Grammy nomination. Well, I didn't know I was going for it, you know, but apparently she had been, she had a feeling. You know, my wife is an amazing woman. She uh, she has intuition, and uh, but she just believes in me so much. But it was so good. So my wife says, this is God rewarding you for taking me to Disney World. <laughs> So, yeah, I got up for uh, Best Roots Gospel Album. The coolest thing about this is that uh, I didn't win, but the person who did win, Reba McIntyre, actually recorded a song that I wrote on her album that won, and the album is called Sing It Now, which is the song that I wrote, Sing It Now. So I wow. lost to, I lost to my own song. So, but you got the title <laughs> track. Yeah, yeah. So it was pretty, it was bittersweet. It was pretty neat, but uh, of course he wanted to win. But, you know, you realize when you're up against Reba, it's probably... Her chances are probably a little better than yours, yes. and uh, but congrats to her. And again, when it comes to the Grammys, it truly is just an honor to be nominated. I know it's a cliche, but did it's you, the truth. Did you go? Yeah, we went. In fact, uh, my baby brother went with his wife, uh, my youngest brother. And I tell you what, he's got two kids, so he, he never gets to get out of the house and never been in New York City. So it was so cool to be able to experience that with him. Did you have uh, to pay to get in? Did we have to pay? No. We didn't because I was nominated. Now, if, if really, yeah, because you know the pay. Dove Awards, you you, I had to you had to pay like a lot of. It's not like a little bit of money. Oh, it's a lot. It's like a lot of money. The Grammys is probably ten times that. Uh, the seats that we had at the Grammys were probably, I don't know, fifteen hundred dollars seats. That's just for one. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't that much. But I had to pay when I had yeah. a couple of Dove uh, nominations. I had to pay to oh, go yeah. to go to go lose. Yeah, the Doves you do have to pay. I had yeah. to pay to lose. Now, if I'm performing, I've performed at the Doves three or four times, and if you're performing, you don't. You'll get a free ticket. But if okay. you're just nominated, you, they didn't you want to hear me sing. See, that's what that's all about. Man, I know what is. They want to hear you sing because you sing good. You know, before this interview started, I heard some singing by the interviewer, and let me just tell you, the dude has got some pipes, <laughs> and his pitch is pretty darn solid. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> So, so, so I don't know how we're getting on awards. I have no idea what that's about. But uh, Dove Awards, how, how are you on Dove Awards? It just uh, well, I think I've maybe had mm, four or five nominations, and I just won my first one back in uh, last year, 2017. So what do you do with your Dove Award? 
It is on my. I have a bookshelf that I keep my stuff on my uh-huh. <laughs> awards, and uh, so it's up there. Yeah, I have a couple. I have a couple. One I won with the Perrys, and then this one's just uh, for my solo album uh, Resurrection. Now, I, I think uh, the coolest thing. I was the first solo artist to ever win that category. It was because you know Southern Gospel is very much group driven, started right. by quartets. Solo artists had never won Southern Gospel Album of the Year, so that was a pretty big honor, really humbling experience to be able to to do that, and uh, just so grateful. And you know, just where I came from, which I think we'll get into, and what God's done in my life is is pretty miraculous. It's just a miraculous thing what God has done. I'm so grateful. You are listening to the Rick Altizer Show on Bot Radio, and my guest today is singer Joseph Habedank. And uh, I know somebody who uses uh, their, um, their Dove Award as a toilet paper holder. Toilet roll You're paper You're lying. Holder. They put their toilet paper on. Are you allowed to say who it is? That's uh, a no. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Oh, that's funny. I don't know, but I think her initials might be Margaret Becker. But anyway, oh! I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that, though. Oh, I'm man, not, But I'm not awful. sure. Don't quote me on that. But I've heard... You know that they use it to put uh, keep toilet paper on it. You oh, know? How would that? How would that well, work? Well, it had the it had the little the little the dove. Uh, oh, so it's like it's, it's the, one of the it, older ones. It had like a dove with a wing that went. Oh up. yeah, yeah, okay. It was like it would yeah, point up. That makes sense. Yeah. So you could put the toilet paper right where the thing pointed. You know. You know, I I really cherish mine because, you know, when I started my solo ministry, I, I just I had no idea if it would fly. And in fact, a lot of people told me. You're not going to make it. I mean, this is a group-driven, harmony-driven industry, Southern Gospel Music is. There's no way um, you're going to make it. You don't have a big enough name. And then here we are four years later, and um, I won my first Dove Award and got a Grammy nomination and then won Soloist of the Year at the uh, Fan Awards, which is the Southern Gospel. So it's just an amazing thing. And it can only be explained by what God can do with somebody. Yes. Um, it, and don't let anybody tell you that Habedank is not a big name. Oh, it's a big. It is. Big, it is a big name. That is for sure. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm being obviously. H a b e d a n k. In case anybody's wondering. Have a day. Have a dank. Hey, how can people find out about you? Well, that's uh, you'll need that spelling. You can do that uh, by spelling my last name and my first name, Joseph Habedank dot com, and of course Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, all, all those things. Stuff. All those things are great. Um, have a dank. That's e d a n k. H a b like hab. E D like Ed and A N K. Yeah, I have to tell people Altizer. I have to when I send people, you know, at the end of the show, I send them to my Facebook page or you know the podcast, yeah. whatever. I have to spell Altizer. I think I've got it. it. You ready? A L T I Z E R. You got it. You Did are I do a it? genius. Woo! I was homeschooled too. That's a big deal. You are a genius. Well, hey, let's let's, let's switch gears. We're having a great time here. Joseph's a great hang. We were actually. Uh, I'm doing a uh, a, a movie on Russ Taff, and you, yeah. we're being interviewed uh, about this Russ Taff movie that we're doing. And so we, we're kind of taking a break from that and doing this radio show while we're doing it. But uh, in that, Russ talks about his addiction, and then you, you open up about some stuff that you went through. Uh, do you mind just going into your story, telling us a little bit about kind of your story? Not at all. I'd be glad to, and I hope this will encourage somebody out there today. I, I was uh, raised in a great Christian home. But I was raised around addiction. Had a brother that was introduced to drugs at an early age at, in Christian school, of all places. Um, got hooked. And uh, it's funny because I, I grew up hating addiction. And I absolutely, absolutely hated what it did, the dysfunction. And I got, I got to tell you, as the years went on, my brother's life spiraled out of control. But on the flip side of that, all my dreams started coming true really early age. All I ever wanted to do was sing. Got to sing with the Perrys. They hired me when I was 17 years old. I don't admit this a lot, but my mom allowed me to drop, to not do my senior year if I would take my GED. And I did. I I skipped my senior year so I could join a group because all I ever wanted to do was sing. Moved to Morristown, Tennessee. The group had relocated to Nashville. I had taken the lead singer position. I, initially, I was a baritone singer. They moved me up to the lead. We had moved to Nashville. I was up late one night. My mom calls me. Now, my mom is a single mom, so she relied on me as the oldest child quite a bit. I pick up the phone. Mom's crying. And I knew it was probably about my middle brother, Nate. And he was living at the, on the streets at the time. And she was just weeping. And she said, I don't know where he's going to sleep. And I don't know what he's going to eat. And 
um, I don't know what I'm going to do. Will you pray? Most fascinating thing about this story is this. I got down on my knees and prayed out of desperation. God, will you just take my brother's addiction away and give it to me? Because I can handle it better than he can. Two things, or several things wrong with that prayer, but one of the two things that stand out is, number one, most arrogant prayer I've ever prayed. Number two, the devil heard that prayer. And uh, not too many days after that, I woke up, had a sore throat, not a big deal. Thought maybe I was getting a cold, allergies. Come to find out there's an ulcer on the back of my throat. It had grown to be the size of a quarter. Abscessed in my face, my jaw, my ear. Worst pain I'd ever been in. I get on the bus that weekend. I'm still with the Perrys at the time. And we go to Franklin, North Carolina, leaving on a Wednesday night. We're supposed to sing in Franklin on a Thursday. But before the concert, there was a lady meeting us there to take us to her house to eat lunch. And I walk off the bus, and I'm holding my face in pain, and she sees very, very visible that I'm in pain. She says, how in the world are you going to sing? And I said, you know, I'll get through it. I'll be fine. And and I'm not crying, but I'm, I mean, it's the worst pain I've ever been in. She said, well, very innocently, she said, my mom lives right next door to wherever we're having lunch. I think she's got some medicine that will help. And I thought, great. Went to her house, sat down to eat lunch. She walks right up next to me, got my plate there, food. She said, I want you to take these two pills with your lunch. Otherwise, you'll get sick because they are narcotic. She said, take these two pills, eat your lunch. You should start getting a little bit of relief. So I did. Took the two pills, ate my lunch. And I remember when lunch was over, I walked from the dining room into the living room of her home. And I sat down in the Lazy Boy recliner. I remember like it was yesterday. Started watching TV. Basketball was on. It was on ESPN. And within five minutes of me sitting down in that chair, the pain medicine that she had given me started kicking into my bloodstream. And every single problem in my life disappeared. Every insecurity I had, gone. And that quick, the devil began to whisper in my ear, man, this is what you've been missing your whole life. Scared kid, broken home, just want people to like you, kind of introverted, kind of a loner. And this pill makes you talkative, fun, outgoing. And this pill that makes normal people feel abnormal makes you feel normal and it's really uh, and i say this in my concerts a lot it's amazing the lies the devil will tell you to get you to do what he wants you to do and by the way for anybody who's listening he is and always has been a liar and you cannot believe anything that comes out of his mouth but anybody who's ever become addicted to anything will tell you it doesn't happen overnight little by little i'd begin to be reintroduced to prescription narcotics whether someone would have them on the bus I would fake an injury to try, just a little experimental, until finally my body started becoming dependent on them. And I had to have them, and I was taking them from people, and and uh, people were giving them to me, and and uh, the group ended up finding out about it. And they gave me a few chances, and this I just the, kept... The Perrys. The Perrys, yeah. Just kept using, kept using, couldn't, couldn't quit, didn't know how to quit. And uh, finally they came to me and said, hey, you know, we... You can't be on the road anymore. We just can't do this. And they said, you know, what would you like to do? And I said, if you allow me to, I'd like to resign. And they said, okay. So I resigned in May of 2013 and um, was so broken, so scared, so embarrassed. You know, I didn't know how to fix it. And uh, before I get to the recovery part of my story, a lot of people ask about my brother, Nate. Um, and he's actually, for the first time in 15 years, uh, just checked into a Christian treatment facility in Columbus, Ohio called Refuge Ministries. They have different phases of the program, and he just graduated from phase one to phase two. So he seems to be doing well, and I would would really appreciate um, people's prayers for him. His name's Nathan, and uh, I believe God can do a mighty work in his life like he's done in mine. This is uh, the Rick Altizer Show on Bot Radio, and you're listening to uh, my interview with Joseph Habedank, a uh, very interesting interview about uh, the struggle with addiction. So if you know anybody who's uh, struggling with addiction, you might want to uh, send this podcast to them. But, Joseph, let's let's continue with your story. The good part of the story is uh, that I went and got help. But, you know, there's a lot of great Christian people that I know who are anti-rehab because they just believe that God can do it, and he can. But if God can use a donkey, he can use a rehab. That's what I always tell people, people that are anti-rehabilitation. I checked into a place called Cumberland Heights just outside of Nashville, and I was scared, so scared. And yet... I had this excitement because I just had a feeling that what I'm doing today, I just had a feeling that it was going to happen. I knew God could use this story. I knew he could. If I could do my part, do the right thing, get help, get clean, get sober, I knew he could use it. 
And so while I'm scared and terrified and not even sure if I'll ever sing again, I really felt like God could use it for his glory. So I check in um, and I started reading my Bible every night. And uh, I started reading about this guy named David. We all know the story of David. But I could really relate with David because, I mean, the guy's a singer, songwriter, and man, had he messed up. And yet, God says, he's a man after my own heart. What well, that moment in my life, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You're talking about a guy that committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba, had her husband Uriah killed. How in the world could you call him a man after your own heart? It didn't make sense to me. And I knew the story. But it was in that moment that God spoke to me and said, it's not that David fell, but it's what he chose to do when he got up. And all of a sudden, I began to think, God, if you could fix David, you could fix me. If you could heal David, you could heal me. If you could use him, could you somehow, some way, use me? And that's been the 1,747 days ago today that I've been off of all prescription pain medicine. And Praise the Lord. I know every single day because it matters. It matters to me. Every day is a new victory. And I've uh, been almost in May. It'll be five. May of 2018 will be five years. And God has just done an amazing work in my life. Not only am I recovering recovered, but I get to sing now and I get to share my story all over the country. And last week is in Dallas, Texas and West Texas. The week before that is all over the state of California and getting ready to go to Mexico and Haiti and Jamaica. And the doors that God opens when you're honest with people and just tell them, hey, I'm broken. I'm flawed. I'm just like you. And when you tell people that they instantly relate with what you're saying and what you're singing. They're more prone to listen to your songs if you say, hey, I'm messed up, but Jesus loves me, and he loves you too. So someone right now is listening to the show, and there's someone that they know, close, a relative, a loved one, a close friend who's struggling with addiction, they know they are, who's not looking for help right now, and they're stuck in the addiction. Hmm. Can you help me talk to that person? First off, what do you recommend that person do about their loved one who's, who's an addict? The important thing to remember is that we cannot make people recover from their addiction. They have to want it. And that's hard. I wanted to fix my brother so bad when I got sober. I I thought, man, I've done it. He can do it. It's not that simple. The addict has to want it. But the number one thing that I would recommend outside of the obvious, which is prayer, 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 that is vital to this. But always be open in communication, because an addict does not want to talk. But if they know that you love them and you can gain their trust, they'll talk to you. Say, hey, man, I noticed some changes in you. I know you've struggled with addiction in the past. So what, what kind of stuff are you using now? And, you know, what can we, let's talk about it, you know. And he can share what he, what you know, maybe what he's, what he's been hooked on and would start there. Well, what do you think? You think you can ever quit maybe doing that? And then they say, yes. Oh, great. Well, when do you think you do you think you when do you think you'll be ready to do that? I mean, just open up communication and talk about what God can do. But here's the important thing: an addict doesn't want to hear preaching, especially if they're a Christian. They already know, they know. And there's a lot of people who are raised in church, like me, who claim to be a believer, who struggle with addiction because of prescription drugs. They're so so common now. Um, but I, I would say, outside of the spiritual aspect, which is vital, prayer. Um, but it's, it's talking, being communication, communicate with the addict. They don't want to talk. That's fine. Try again. Try next time. Catch them in a good mood and pray about w- w- the kind of doors that God can open for you to talk to them, whether it's your son or your daughter. My, my mom, uh, I'll give her this. Uh, she's does a pretty good job talking to my brother, Nate, you know, about it. And my, my baby brother, which a lot of people, he's kind of hidden in the story is he was an alcoholic and it was in the service military and. Um, took a leave of absence, went to rehab, got better, and he's been sober a little longer than I have. So two out of the three of us are sober, and my brother's in treatment right now. So, you know, God can do anything. I mean, even when it seems hopeless, um, he can save your kids. He can save your grandkids. He can save your friends and your spouse. Um, But I think talking is hard. That's important. It's vital. You are listening to The Rick Altizer Show on Bot Radio. My guest today, Joseph Habedank. Uh, we're talking about addiction, and uh, again, if you, you know someone who needs to hear this, uh, you can 
find this on my website. You can get this uh, on the uh, podcast, on iTunes, and all the places where they have podcasts. Uh, and share this with them. Uh, so, Joseph, talk to me about now for that addict who's listening to this or who someone is sharing this podcast with right now. Talk to that person who says, man, I am stuck. I, I, this thing's bigger than me. I don't, I don't know if I even want to start this road of, of finding, you know, talk to that guy because he was you. So talk to yeah. him. The number one thing I would say, if you're an addict right now and you're in a, what we call active addiction, which means you're using on a daily basis, hourly basis, I would say don't wait another second to talk to somebody and go get help. And don't wait until the podcast is over. Don't wait. Say, you know what? I'll handle this. I can handle this tomorrow and the next Because you won't. You won't handle it. You have to talk to somebody. If you got a pastor, go talk to your pastor. Uh, if you got a, you got a friend who you trust, uh, go talk to your friend. It's the same thing uh, as it was for the parent. You have to talk about it. Because what addicts don't want to do, they don't want to talk. They want to isolate. They want to hide. They want to use. That's it. And they don't want anybody messing up their high. But if you'll do it tonight, right now, today, whenever you're hearing this, this morning, whenever this airs, if you'll do it right now, pick up the phone, text somebody, call somebody, say, hey, I'm struggling with addiction. I need some help. Can you help me? That seems hard, but those words right there, I just said them, they're not that hard to say. They might be hard for you, but they're not as hard as you think. If you'll just be open and honest and tell somebody you need help and call, man, this is so vital. Call out to God. Such a big thing in recovery was the 12th step. I worked a 12-step program, and I'm very proud of that. But the 12th step is, is having a spiritual awakening. My spiritual awakening was Jesus, having, having a, this, this spiritual awakening with Jesus Christ. And my spiritual awakening was this. God loves broken people. He loves broken people. In the Bible, man, it's all throughout the Bible. If you're listening and you're an addict, you're the kind of person that Jesus hung out with. He hung out with the, the prostitutes, the liars, the thieves. The only time he ever got ticked off in the Bible was at a church person, a Pharisee who was you know, in the temple. He loves people like you. Like He loves you. He wants you to get help. And God has made amazing resources um, even here in Nashville, Tennessee, which has got such a great recovery uh, recovery community. But there are so many places all over the country that their primary purpose is helping people just like you. But, man, just an important thing, talk to somebody, talk to Jesus, but talk to a, talk to a person, um, a friend, a pastor, your mom, your dad, your, even your grandparents, somebody you deeply respect, somebody that you know can take it, somebody that you know is not going to flip out, but they're going to say, hey, let, let, let's handle this head on. And by the way, nobody is going to want to hear that you're an addict, but they'll be awful glad that you came to them. You're probably going to disappoint some people, and that's okay. But Jesus loves you, and guess what? They'll forgive you, and you'll forgive yourself. You can do it. Tell you what I'd like to do. I'm going to ask you to pray for that person. And I'm going to ask everybody listening right now to pray with Joseph. Just wherever you are, what you're doing, pray right now. For, for those addicts who are listening who need to go to that next step and get help. Lord, you know there is somebody right now at this moment that needs you. And they need to know that you love them. You love them so much that you left the most amazing place in the world to die for them. You left heaven, not just to come down here and live. But you came down here to die for addiction, for alcoholism, every sin of the human race. And there is someone listening right now that needs to be reminded. I want to ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would comfort their heart, that you would let them feel right now the love and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that you can and do offer every day. But you want to offer it to them. You want to give it to them. I pray that not only would you give them a sweet peace, whether they're high or drunk, right now at this very moment that you would give them a peace and that you would give them more importantly a courage to talk to somebody a courage and it, man it takes so much courage lord you know you know how much courage it took for me to finally say i'm an addict i need help but i know that you can do anything your bible the word of god teaches us that nothing nothing is impossible with you 
So right now, I'm going to ask you, based on that verse and standing on the Word of God, that you would give that young man, that young woman, that man, that woman, the older man, the older woman, whoever it may be, whatever age they may be, I pray right now that you would give them the courage to pick up the phone and talk to someone and just say, I need some help. I'm struggling. I'm addicted. I got chains, and I need you to break them. And God, we know you're still in the business of breaking chains. You are still in the business of setting people free. And so we pray that right now you will do that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. All God's people said amen. And, uh, you know, as thank you for listening. Thank you, Joseph, for being here. My honor, man. Thank you. And we ask my listeners, keep praying. Pray for those people who are addicted. If you have people you know, loved ones, pray for them. And, uh, Joseph, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. If there's a show you've missed, you can go to my website, rickaltizer.com, and catch up. Or you can listen to my podcast in iTunes or wherever you hear your podcasts. Just search for The Rick Altizer Show. Altizer is spelled A-L-T-I-Z-E-R. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening.